Hi everyone, my name is Catherine Backus and I'm Director, Climate Finance and Science at the INTAC Center on Climate Adaptation. For those of you unfamiliar with the INTAC Center, we are an applied research center to the University of Waterloo in Ontario, Canada, that helps homeowners, communities, businesses and governments reduce risks associated with climate change and extreme weather events, particularly in relation to flooding, wildfire and extreme heat. It's a great pleasure to be able to take part in these TED Countdown discussions, which have showcased so much great work being done on mitigating greenhouse gases and ways to deploy clean energy and carbon capture technologies to get greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. These strategies are imperative to avoid the worst impacts of climate change in the future. But we must acknowledge that severe impacts of climate change are already present today and will continue to be present into the future. And so adaptation must also be an important part of the discussion. As you can see from the photos here, climate change manifests itself as extreme weather, with examples including the devastating flooding and mudslides that are occurring right now in British Columbia and on the east coast of Canada. This past summer, heat waves across North America, wildfires in British Columbia, California, Greece, and Turkey, flash floods in Germany, Belgium, China, and Costa Rica. These events cause power outages, supply chain impacts, evacuations, socioeconomic implications, and loss of life. And so we must amplify the discussion around adaptation as the impacts of extreme weather are occurring right now. So this is what I'm here to focus on, how climate change is exacerbating extreme weather, what the financial and social costs associated with these events are and how they're increasing, and more importantly, how well-informed standards, codes, and guidelines have already been developed to improve the resiliency of Canada to a changing climate, but are being deployed too slowly. So this presentation will showcase Canada's urgent need to adapt. To offer some background, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, their sixth assessment report, and Environment and Climate Change Canada, their changing climate report of 2019, both determined firstly that climate change is real, that it has happened, it is happening, and it will continue to happen. And therefore, climate change is in fact locked in and will be for centuries to come. In other words, over the course of the last 100 years, the Earth has warmed by approximately 1.1 degrees Celsius and it will continue to warm. We can slow down the rate of change, but we cannot reverse it, at least not with the technology that we currently have. Secondly, they determine that climate change is human induced. For those who say that climate change has happened in the past, I would agree with them. It has. But reasons for previous changing climate events, such as the tilting of the Earth's axis, radiation from the sun, volcanic eruptions, an asteroid, cannot explain the change in climate that is occurring right now. Only when we look at the impacts of burning of fossil fuels, natural gas, coal, oil, that when burnt release greenhouse gases that concentrate and trap energy in the envelope of the Earth's atmosphere that would have otherwise escaped into space. This causes warming and the manifestation of extreme weather. Now I'm going to focus on precipitation here as flooding is the greatest risk to Canadians. So among other points, warm air holds more moisture. So if you have more moisture and more energy in the system, when water condenses and comes down in the form of precipitation, we end up with bigger storms, with more water coming down over shorter periods of time. The energy that went into evaporating that water in the first place, that doesn't disappear. It stays in the system. So storms are coming down with even greater force than ever before. So for all of you with the general perception that storms seem bigger today than they did in the past, you're correct. If you go to the US Climate Data Center, you'll find that towards the western end of the Great Lakes, the intensity of storms have increased by 37% more today than 70 years ago. Toward the eastern end, the intensity of those storms have increased by 70% compared to 70 years ago. So given we understand that the burning of fossil fuels has driven these more intense storms, then the expression of climate change as extreme weather risk will only continue to worsen with the further burning of fossil fuels. So the question is, are we going to continue to burn fossil fuels? According to the International Energy Agency, which is the authority on global energy use, 80% of the world's energy supply comes from a third, a third, a third, oil, coal, and natural gas. By 2035, it's estimated that 80% of the world's energy supply will continue to come from a third, a third, a third, oil, coal, and natural gas, but global energy output will actually be 12 to 15% higher 
with one key reason being that population rates continue to rise. Positive feedback loops also contribute to the increasing impacts of climate change as the image on the right shows. So as an example, as temperatures continue to rise, ice and snow cover will continue to melt. Ice and snow cover reflects sun and its heat away from the Earth's surface. When the ice and snow melt, dark surfaces, such as bodies of water, will absorb that heat, contributing to rising temperatures and then melting more ice and snow. So climate change is driving climate change, and this is happening at such a fast rate that there is no new normal. These effects will continue to increase the manifestation of climate change as extreme weather and the costs associated with those impacts. There's no better witness than the property and casualty, the PNC insurance sector, where the impacts of flood, fire, wind, etc., can be tallied almost instantly. So this image here displays the annual catastrophic insurable losses for Canada. A cat loss is any event such as a flood, fire, hailstorm, etc., that triggers $25 million or more in insurable losses. Between 1983 to 2008, losses ranged from 250 to 450 million dollars for extreme weather events as you can see from 2009 onward which is within the blue boxed region there is a discernible upward trend in losses losses now average 1.8 billion dollars a year with 11 out of the 12 of the last years being above 1 billion dollars last year 2020 losses were over 2 billion dollars for the year so to also clarify, the losses represented here are corrected for inflation as of 2020 and per capita wealth accumulation. So we are looking at a comparison of apples to apples. It's also important to note that these are insurable losses. Multiply this graph by three to four times and what you'll get is uninsurable losses that individuals and governments are paying out of pocket for. For government specifically, that's money coming out of budgets for hospitals, schools, infrastructure development. And with COVID-19, there's no excess money for spending. So we must understand the socioeconomic impacts that are happening because of climate change. Now, if we take Fort McMurray out of this graph as it acts as almost an outlier in this case, flooding is greater than 50% of all losses throughout Canada. So these losses are mostly coming from flooding manifesting itself as flooded basements. So remember, we're talking about insurable losses here. So across Canada, premiums are drastically increasing, cap limits are decreasing to 10 to $20,000, and yet a flooded basement costs on average $43,000. If your flooded basement happens on a Monday, it has to be cleared out by the Wednesday because the flood was probably caused by sewer backup or sewer water, which would make the house uninhabitable. But if your cap limits are at 10 to $20,000, then a homeowner could be on the line for $33,000 within two days. And yet prior to COVID-19, 50% of Canadians were living paycheck to paycheck. And we know that number has grown because of COVID. So we're not just talking about the financial impacts to insurance, but we're talking about the uninsurability and the instability of the Canadian housing market. So this is where the Intax Center's new report, which will be released in January, Treading Water, Impact of Flooding on Canada's Residential Housing Market, really comes into play. So the purpose of this report was to determine if community level flooding has impact on average sold price of a house, average days on market, and total homes on market, and mortgage arrears and deferrals. So the slide here really highlights the results quite well, but in short, Homes located in flooded communities saw an 8.2% reduction in sold price. They stayed on the market 19.8% longer and 44.3% less homes were listed on the market in flooded communities. When we investigated average mortgage arrears and deferrals, there was no material impact. So up until this point, we've talked about financial costs, but what are the social costs of climate change? In 2017, our team conducted interviews with households that experienced basement flooding in Burlington, Ontario, which in August of 2014 experienced an atypical and severe precipitation event, resulting in 3,500 homes being flooded. So these microburst storms are becoming more and more frequent, which is something cities across Canada should be paying attention to. One of the fundamental questions that we documented was on a scale of zero to five, five being the worst. 
we ask people to grade how much stress they feel during precipitation events. Now remember, this study was conducted three years after the flood event had occurred, and yet as you can see from this graph, flooded household members experience significant higher worry and stress every time precipitation events occur. Additionally, flooded household members were forced to take days off of work due to the flooding, an average of seven days. So lost time from work, psychosocial stressors associated with medication uptake, all of these claims go through life and health insurers that may have thought that they were immune to climate change, but now understand that it is material to their business. So what we determined was that climate change does not have financial, but also mental health costs as well, meaning that a major flood event could stress an already stressed healthcare system. So giving you a lot of information, most of which is quite depressing, but narrowing in on how these impacts manifest allows societies to operationalize on ways to reduce these risks. So how do we reduce these risks, you ask? Well, the Intact Centre works with groups like the National Research Council, Standards Council of Canada, and the Canadian Standards Association. And generally speaking, for any of the reports that you see here, we bring together 40 to 60 people on average from across the country with relevant expertise to develop these reports and come up with meaningful and cost-effective ways to adapt. The Intact Centre has developed very good guidance on what we need to do to mitigate risk from flood, fire, and we're working on heat reduction strategies now. So I'd like to dive into these reports to focus on a few key areas. So for guidance, the report on the left drills down on characteristics around and inside a home that when precipitation events occur could impact the probability that a home is flooded. From that report, the home flood protection infographic on the right was created and provides 15 key steps that any homeowner can take to reduce their risk of flooding. From our research with Canadian Red Cross, 70% of homeowners that report receiving the home flood protection infographic in their tax notices operationalize at least two of these measures within six months of receiving the mail out. So this infographic would be a great addition to property tax notices, utility bills, even encouraging promotion through real estate agents, insurance brokers, and mortgage providers. So as we leave the home and head towards more of the community level risk protection, flood risk protection, the report on the right outlines practical approaches to limit flood risk in Canada, summarizing best practices from national guidelines and standards. So as an example, when designing and building new residential communities to be more flood resilient, the number one action is do not build on a floodplain, as these areas always run a higher risk of flooding and building really should be avoided there. For existing communities, the most common challenges include riverine flooding, overland flooding, storm and sewer backup flooding, and foundation drainage systems failure, so sump pump failures. So there's a multitude of actions that can be engaged to limit flood risk for existing communities, which would include flood walls, berms, diversion channels, holding ponds, cisterns, uh, sewer separation projects, and maintaining naturalized areas, which I will say needs to be priority going forward. So everything I've listed, these are preventative measures rather than say deploying sandbags during a flood event, which is basically a sign to say we're unprepared. So sandbags should really be the point of last resort. So a lot of this presentation is focused on flooding as it is the costliest extreme weather event in Canada. Yet, as we all know, when the summer months come rolling in, fire dominates the news and becomes the second greatest risk to Canadians. So following in line with the home flood protection, home wildfire protection has also been developed. So the Intact Centre has worked closely with Fire Smart Canada to develop this one page infographic, which drills down to determine what changes can be made to the characteristics of a home to drastically reduce partial or full property and infrastructure damage. Two measures alone, moving combustible materials, firewood, bushes, etc., 10 meters from the home and adding a steel roof reduces your chances of having your home burned down by 90%. Finally, the Intact Center team is in the process of finalizing a report which highlights the impacts of extreme weather on infrastructure and services, natural systems, the economy, and community health. Four factors contribute to the formation of a heat island effect, 
So these are urban areas associated with pockets of higher air and or surface temperature rel relative to surrounding areas. So these factors include the replacement of natural infrastructure, trees, vegetation, water bodies with human made infrastructure, roads, sidewalks, buildings, urban geometry. So the size and spacing of buildings within a city can influence wind flow and the ability to absorb and release solar energy. Heat generated from human activities um, and geographic features can all influence the heat island effect. So the report sets out the actions that individuals, building owners, managers and communities can take to reduce risks associated with extreme heat. So this would include non-structural, so individual behavioral solutions as an example. Natural infrastructure solutions, so retaining, restoring or rebuilding natural infrastructure. And this would include uh, green buildings as well as another example. And built infrastructure solutions, so passive and active cooling. Uh, buildings as an example. So as you've seen from this presentation, well-informed standards, codes and guidelines have already been developed to improve the resiliency of Canada to a changing climate, but Canada lacks the proper mechanisms to deploy these tools faster. With further facilitation of home flood protection, community level flood preparedness, home wildfire protection, and extreme heat risk reduction measures. Canada must deploy these tools and urgently adapt now. Thank you so much for your time and have a wonderful day.